What is the number one meal to clean out your arteries? <laughs> it's not what you think it is. Why? Because about 90% of doctors, maybe more, and nearly every other YouTube video on this topic has gotten it completely wrong. They all lack a fundamental understanding of how the dance between your arteries, the plaque inside of them, and what actually causes you to have a heart attack or stroke because of that dance even works. Can you even clean out your arteries? If so, how? And is this even the right question to ask? Does it even matter? What is the insulin spiral of death? Does your LDL really even matter? Should you be worried about it? What markers should you actually be worried about? What are the real grim reapers? What about supplements like apple cider vinegar, niacin, vitamin K2? Do they even do anything? Wait a minute. Don't only older people have to worry about heart attack and stroke? What about people in their 20s, their 30s? How does plaque in your arteries affect your blood flow? How can you actually reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke and therefore death itself? What should you really be looking at or looking for? Do those fancy stents that surgeons want to put in your arteries even do anything? Now, see, these are the questions we're going to answer in this video. And the answers to them are likely to surprise you and even likely to save your life if you pay attention. We're going to start off with two major misunderstandings everyone misses about what you'd call clean arteries. Then we're going to dive into four of the real questions that you should be asking and, in, and introduce you to an often missed hidden third actor, the Grim Reaper's insulin spiral of death. The real menace in all of this, which you may want to know about. That is, if you don't want to die or be partially brain dead earlier in your life than you should. Next, we'll cover seven common misperceptions nearly everyone, including most doctors, have, such as the belief that fancy stents placed in one's arteries to try to expand them will actually prevent a heart attack, or it's just you being scammed by bad science, bad medicine, along with corrections to the idea that LDL even matters as much as everyone says it does. Then we'll kick down the door on four supplement distortions you're being told about. Does vitamin K2 do anything, as other prominent YouTube doctors say that it does? What about apple cider vinegar? Is it anything more than a wife's tale? Finally, we'll get to that number one meal that cleans out your arteries and why it is what it is. Before we get to the lowdown on that number one meal that will clean out your arteries, it's important to understand the nitty gritty of what's getting them all gunked up in the first place and how that even matters. Also, let's just say, for simplicity's sake, dirty arteries means arteries that are packed with plaque. Let's start off by defining what plaque actually even is, because you can't solve something without understanding it. Now here's the scene, plaque. That's like the uninvited guest in your bloodstream. It's made of cholesterol and it's not just floating around, it gets cozy, wedging itself inside the layers of your artery wall. It's like having a squatter in your house, settling in where it's not wanted. Understanding this, it's like turning on the lights in a dark room. You can finally see what's really going on and then you can start to figure out how to clean up the mess. So before we get to that miracle meal, we got to know the enemy, that cholesterol stowaway in our arteries. First, we'll start off with the two most major core misunderstandings everybody has about cleaning out their arteries. Core misunderstanding number one, how plaque affects blood flow. We've got a bit of a mix up about how plaque messes with our blood flow. Most folks think our arteries are like the pipes in your bathroom getting clogged up with plaque like hair in a drain. But hold up, that's not quite right. You see, our arteries, they're not rigid like those old copper pipes. They're more like those newfangled garden hoses, flexible and able to stretch. They can get bigger, they can get smaller. So this whole idea of 
plaque blocking things up like hair in a drain? That's not really how it goes down, pun intended. Our arteries, they're dynamic. They're living things. They don't just get clogged and stay that way. They react. They change. They adapt. Plaque in our arteries? It's a more complex game than just simple blockage. Misunderstanding number two. Plaque doesn't get cleaned out. It gets stabilized. Plaque in your arteries, it's not like you can just scrub it out. What really happens is it gets stabilized. To get this, we need to understand the difference between hot plaque, that's the inflamed kind, and stable plaque. Let's break it down. There are two types of plaque. One's like a ticking time bomb, the soft plaque. That's the stuff that ups your risk for heart attack and strokes. Then there's the other type, the cool customer, almost like taking a chill pill. That's your stable plaque almost risk-free. So this soft plaque, it's inflamed. It's risky. But stable plaque, that's like the healed version of the inflamed risk. It's chilled out, settled down, almost like it's put its wild days behind it. Now, why does all this matter? Let's take a little detour into academia. There was this guy, Honda, who snapped pictures of soft and calcified plaque. The giveaway? Calcium flex. When soft plaque heals up, when the inflammation simmers down, it leaves these little calcium souvenirs. The folks with calcium in their plaque, they were like skating by without heart attacks or strokes. But those missing the calcium, not so lucky. So knowing what kind of plaque you're dealing with is critical because it's the inflammation causing the heart attack, not the hard, chilled out plaque. Here's the play-by-play -play of a heart attack or a stroke. You've got this inflamed plaque, right? The inflammation gets too rowdy, erupts like a volcano, and spews pus out into your arteries. This goop, this pus, hits the bloodstream. It causes blood to form a clot. Now, if that clot is big enough and it hits the heart, that's a heart attack. If the clot is big enough and it goes to the brain, that's a stroke. Now, let's get to the three real questions that you should be asking in terms of what meal will clean out your arteries. Number one, how can I decrease my risk for heart attack and stroke? Number two, how can I find out if I have soft plaque? And number three, if I know that I have soft plaque, how can I stabilize it? Real question number one. How can I decrease my risk for heart attack and stroke? First off, you got to take a look, a good hard look at what's going on. It's like peering under the hood of a 67 Camaro. You got to understand the mechanics to fix anything. It's not just about shedding a few pounds or beefing up those muscles. It's more about fine tuning your carb intake to jive with what your body's craving and can burn. At our clinic, we don't play games. We don't guess around. We dive deep with lab tests to get the real picture of what's happening inside of you. It's like having a roadmap to your health. We do this oral glucose tolerance test. It's a bit like a carb challenge. We see how your body dances with those carbs, and then we measure your insulin response after downing 75 grams of glucose. Now, this is a solid way to check if your body's grooving right with glucose. Plus, we've got this lipid fractionation thing. It's the next level of checking out your cholesterol. It helps us understand exactly how you're dealing with carbs and how your carb metabolism impacts your cholesterol. Now for the heart stuff. We're talking soft plaque. We check out the enzymes, the inflammation markers in your blood to catch any trouble earlier. Myeloproxidase, LPPLA2, C-reactive protein. These are the key players that we're watching. They're technical terms. We can help you with that. We don't overlook the small stuff like albumin in your urine because uh, even a tiny bit can be a big red flag for arterial inflammation. The CIMT test is another ace up our sleeve. It's like a high-tech ultrasound in the neck that tells us if you're at risk by checking out the plaque in the artery in your neck. Well, now, wait a minute. Why the neck? Because that, what's happening there 
usually mirrors what's going on in your heart's arteries, as in 95% of the time. So the bottom line, to kick health risks to the curb, you got to pinpoint and tackle their roots. It's all about understanding how your body burns its fuel. We use solid lab tests to get the full picture, no second guessing. High blood sugar and insulin levels are like unwanted guests at a party. They can wreak havoc on your artery walls, trapping cholesterol and causing all sorts of trouble. Metabolism precedes damage, usually by several years. Let me repeat that. What's going on in your metabolism precedes damage in your tissues by years, even decades sometimes by only months. So you've got to watch your metabolism. It turns out a big chunk of folks with heart issues have trouble with carb metabolism, and it often slips under the radar. This can start creeping up on your, in your 30s or even your 20s, and it just gets more sneaky with age, leading to insulin resistance, prediabetes, and damage to your arteries. Studies like the big one from JAMA Network show that it's a common problem, especially as you clock more years. The CDC recently updated these numbers to show that, in their estimate, by the time you're 18, everyone your age and older has a 50% probability of having this problem. Other sources say maybe 80%. Then there's the insulin spiral of death. It sounds dramatic, but it's a real thing. It begins with your body's receptors getting less sensitive to insulin over time, hiking up your blood sugar. Your brain's response, well, if my blood sugar's going up, we need to increase insulin. Crank up the insulin higher. And people don't know this, but high insulin messes with the body's ability to burn fat. Now we struggle burning both carbs and fat. What started off as a problem with one now quickly becomes a problem with both of our key fuels. This ramps up hunger. We can't burn either fuel, so we eat more. This leads to more body fat. Messed up hormone production, insulin resistance. It's a vicious, vicious spiral of death. Overeating, metabolic meltdown, and that's the insulin spiral of death. So what's the move? Tailor your carb intake to what your body can handle. If you can't deal with 75 grams of carbs at a time, back off a little bit. Cut them back. It's all about improving your body composition to tackle insulin resistance, prediabetes, type 2 diabetes. And don't forget, body fat isn't just there for the ride. It's not inert. It's not harmless. It actually creates hormones that drive this problem like resistin, adiponectin, even the satiety hormone leptin. It plays a big role in insulin resistance. Body fat is key. Now, muscle's a game changer too. It's like your body's own glucose regulator. It helps us keep things in check. Resistance, high intensity interval training are key to building these muscle mitochondria, especially when you do resistance training and muscle training in the big muscle groups of your leg. These are crucial for fat burning, but they're also a safety valve for blood sugar going too high. Even the older crowd can benefit big time from HIIT workouts and resistance training. Now, real question number two, how do I find out if I have soft plaque? There's this thing called CIMT, Carotid Intima Media Thickness Test. It's the real deal. It's safe, simple, and straight up. It uses ultrasound, but it's a different beat. You see, plaque ain't picky about where it hangs out. It's not just in your heart or your neck or your legs. It's an everywhere kind of problem. Why? Because it's not about just the local scene. It's a global metabolic thing. Remember, we said this is metabolism. Your metabolism is the ringmaster here, not just some spot in the body. Like we said, metabolism causes the tissue problem. So the tissue and arteries are everywhere. And everywhere tissue is supplied with blood by arteries, that's where this can happen. That's big news, bigger than you might think. Let's mosey on over to plaques and heart attacks. 
If they were just a local party in certain arteries, stents would be the sheriff in town, stopping heart attacks in their tracks. But let's get real. Stents don't stop heart attacks. Are you surprised? Let me repeat it. Stents don't stop heart attacks. It's the truth. Despite most stents being placed, 90% of stents placed to prevent heart attacks, they don't do it. They just don't cut it. You think I'm spinning yarns here? Check out the COURAGE trial, the Orbita trial, the ischemia trial. What happened next? Well, when it became clear that stents weren't preventing heart attacks, the cardiologists doubled down, then tripled down, putting in three times more stents than before these trials demonstrated that they don't work. They're putting in stents like they're going out of style. Now let's circle back to the CIMT. It's going to get some solid pros. It's safer, it's easier, it's got an eye for soft plaque, but it doesn't send you sliding down that slippery slope to the cath lab thinking it's all just a plumbing problem that we can fix with a stent. But here's the flip side, the cons. Most docs, they haven't even heard of a CIMT. Why? Because the early studies were like putting garbage in and expecting gold out. They were hung up on the idea of arterial age based on some shaky assumptions about plaque. Those early studies weren't up to snuff, so CIMT got shelved too soon. But let me tell you, the current top-notch studies, they're showing CIMT in a whole new light. It's a slow road, but CIMT should be making a comeback, just like a good underdog story. Now let's go back to real question number three. If I know that I have soft plaque, how can I stabilize it? Well, first, we've got to figure out how much of that sneaky soft plaque we're dealing with. Once you've got a handle on what and how much of it is stirring up trouble, then it's time to put the brakes on whatever's causing the chaos. And that, my friends, brings us right back to the lab. You see, the heart of the matter, about 80% of the time, it's this sneaky critter called undiagnosed prediabetes or even diabetes. It's like a shadow lurking in the background. And most of the time, we're just overloading on carbs, more than our bodies can burn. It's like throwing a wild party in your arteries, and inflammation is the uninvited guest that just won't leave. It's burning up your artery walls like a bonfire. Now, it might not be easy. Nothing worth doing ever is. But it's simple when you break it down. Cut down on those excess carbs. It's like taking your foot off the gas when you're speeding down the highway. Then build up some muscle. It's your body's natural safety net for when that blood sugar starts climbing. It's like having your own personal bodyguard against that sugar rush. All righty, we have arrived at the seven common misconceptions everybody gets confused by when it comes to your cardiovascular health and the major players in it. Insulin, blood glucose, plaque. LDL, stents, and in the end, your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. It's getting us closer to that magic number one meal that will clean out your arteries. Common misperception number one. Isn't LDL associated with cardiovascular risk? Common misconception number two. People assume that they're in their 20s and 30s, they don't have plaque. Common misconception number three. People assume if they don't eat sugar, they don't have plaque. Common misconception number four, you can reverse the cholesterol in your plaque. Common misconception number five, a stress test will predict a heart attack. Common misconception number six, a stent will prevent a heart attack. Common misconception number seven, if a stent doesn't prevent a heart attack, a cabbage or bypass will. Misconception number one, isn't LDL associated with cardiovascular risk? Sure, there's a strong link between LDL and heart risk. But here's where it gets interesting. Correlation isn't the same thing as causation. It's, it's like maybe you wear your lucky underwear to a ball game and your team ke keeps winning. Does that mean your undies are the secret sauce to victory? Probably not. That's correlation. Causation, on the other hand, is more like eating a bunch of spicy tacos and ending up with a stomachache. That's a straight line. A leads to B. 
Now, what if it's metabolic disease or prediabetes pulling the strings, causing both rising LDL and heart attacks? And guess what? That's exactly what's happening. Imagine a world where 80% of metabolic disease is flying under the radar, undiagnosed. No wonder there's this widespread belief that LDL is the big bad wolf of cardiovascular disease. The lipidology crew, they're folks who've been knee-deep studying fats and heart attacks, lipids. They're so locked into the LDL narrative that they may be missing the forest for the trees. Now, here's a twist. They talk about this thing called LDL discordance. It's when LDL levels don't line up with the risk they assume that it should. It's like trying to piece together a puzzle, but the pieces don't all fit. They're so focused on finding the correlations, maybe they're mixing up the numbers and ending up with a different story. It's been known for quite a while that in some folks, when they cut carbs, their LDL, their so-called bad cholesterol, skyrockets. But it's not clear that these folks with sky-high LDL, because of carb restriction, are at any greater risk for heart problems. There's this term floating around, lean mass hyperresponder. It's about genetic differences. Some people drop carbs, and while other health markers improve, their LDL goes through the roof. Matthew Budoff, he's a cardiologist known for uh, cardiology research, and Dave Feldman is an engineer who stumbled onto this mystery. They're digging into this with a study. They checked out these lean mass hyperresponders. There were a hundred of them. They had an average LDL of 250. That's off the charts. That's one in a thousand. And yet, these hundred people didn't have more plaque than people with normal LDL levels. So what's the deal with that? Well, we're waiting to see, but here's the kicker. The same lifestyle factors leading to prediabetes or metabolic disease can also push up LDL and inflammation. Most people with climbing LDL aren't getting leaner. They're gaining weight because they're not burning gar carbs or fats efficiently or effectively. This excess fat gets stored not just under the skin or around organs. You've heard of peri-organ fat or abdominal fat, apple-shaped gut. This fat's also getting stored in LDL. Can we say LDL isn't linked with plaque? No, we cannot. In fact, high LDL usually does go hand-in-hand -hand with more plaque, higher heart attack risk, except for those lean mass hyperresponders. But is it as cut and dried as the lipidologists want to believe? L a straight line between LDL and heart attack? I don't think so. We've got to look deeper. We've got to consider LDL discordance and other factors that we've talked about. Most of all, we have to consider the fact that 90% of people with carb metabolism problems don't know it because it hasn't been diagnosed yet. Common misconception number two. People assume that if they're in their 20s and 30s, they don't have plaque. There are plenty of young guns, folks in their 20s and 30s, already collecting plaque in their arteries, setting up the stage for trouble as they cruise into their 40s and 50s. It's like a ticking time bomb. So what's loading the dice? We're talking age, genetics, and obesity. And don't forget, Obesity is often riding shotgun with high blood sugar and hyperinsulinemia. Uh, that's a fancy word for too much insulin in the blood. This is just what we've been talking about. Now picture this, the CIMT graphs. Remember the CIMT, that tool that helps you show the plaque story in your own arteries by taking an ultrasound in the neck? Once you get a gander at this nomogram, it's like a reality check. And this isn't just about folks with special risks. It's your everyday Joe and Jane. The CIMT is safe as houses. No worries there. We've seen this plaque buildup show starting as early as five years old. It's like watching a slow motion movie of plaque creeping up year after year, decade after decade. And here's the real deal. You think 30-somethings are immune to plaque? Check out this CIMT picture. 
Oh, and see those lines? The blue one's for the fellas, pink for the ladies. Think about it. Here's the twist. Does that give you a clue regarding why dudes, why guys are usually face the music, heart attack-wise, about a decade before the ladies? Common misconception number three. People assume that if they don't eat sugar, they don't have plaque. People think if they dodge sugar, they're dodging plaque. But here's the kicker. Table sugar, the sweet stuff we all know, it's got a glycemic index of just 50. That means it's only sending your blood sugar half the roller coaster ride that pure glucose does. Now, this doesn't mean that table sugar is safe. It's just not the only culprit, and it's really not the worst. But hold on, it gets wilder. You know those everyday staples, bread, pasta, juices? Bread and pasta especially are like stealthy ninja, ninjas when it comes to hiking up your blood sugar. These bad boys have a glycemic index, and that's through the roof, making them sneakier and quicker at spiking your blood sugar levels than your ordinary table sugar. Common misconception number four, you can reverse the cholesterol in your plaque. There's this misconception floating around, folks thinking they can just reverse the cholesterol in their plaque like flipping a switch. But here's the real talk. You can't just hit rewind on that cholesterol in your plaque. It's not like erasing a mistake on a chalkboard. What you can do, though, is reduce inflammation. That's like calming the storm, stabilizing your cardiovascular risk. Think about it like this. When plaque calcifies, it's like settling down, finding its peace. Because plaque calcifying, that's its way of healing, of getting stable. You don't just magic away plaque. You make it chill out. You stabilize it. It's kind of like trying to remove water from gelatin. Common misconception number five. A stress test will predict a heart attack. A stress test will predict a heart attack? That's like, okay, a stress test measures how well you can scale a mountain, how fast you can run, how, how uh, your cardiovascular fitness is. It's checking your cardiovascular fitness, your heart's mojo. Sure, there's a bit of a connection here to your probability of not having a heart attack, but that's just not the whole story. Take Tim Russert, for example. This guy was a runner, maybe not an Olympian, but he had his game on. Russert, he aced his stress test, colors flying high, and then, out of the blue, a few weeks later, the man's gone. Sudden heart attack. So what gives? Pumping up your heart's muscle does wonders for your pipes, helping them flex and expand, and you get more of those tiny blood vessels weaving into your muscle. Getting your workout groove on, that's gold. It does drop your blood sugar, keeps you fit, and running, high-intensity interval work, resistance training, all of that stuff really works well. But here's the kicker. Just because you can breeze through a stress test, it doesn't mean you're bulletproof against a heart attack. It's like thinking you're safe from a storm just because you've got an umbrella. Life, especially your heart, is a lot more complex than a single test. Common misconception number six, a stent will prevent a heart attack. We've chatted about this before. There are these big deal trials, the COURAGE trial, ORBITA trial, the ischemia trial. They all pointed to one clear thing, stents, even those fancy cardiac bypass graphs, they're called cabbages, coronary artery bypass graph. These things don't uh, they're high-tech plumbing fixes, but they don't prevent heart attacks and strokes. It's a shocker, considering that over 90% of these procedures are done thinking that they will. But hold up. Don't get it twisted. Stents can be lifesavers, real heroes in the clutch. If you're caught in the grip of a heart attack, racing to the hospital, or getting a, an ambulance to the hospital is your best bet. In these moments, a stent can swoop in, clear out the clot, save your life on the spot. So what's the real score here? Less than 10% of stents are used in those life and death moments and can save your heart. 
The other 90% of stents, they're put in with the hope of preventing a heart attack down the road in the future, but they don't do that. They just don't work out that way. This all circles back to a mix-up in thinking. Believing your arteries are like rigid copper pipes when they're more like those newfangled expandable garden hoses. Life, especially when it comes to our hearts, is not as straightforward as fixing a leaky faucet. It's about understanding the whole system, not just patching up parts. Common misconception number seven. If a stent doesn't prevent a heart attack, a bypass will. Now, let's roll back the tape to that earlier mix-up, the ischemia trials. When the Orbita and Courage trials hit the scene, the thoracic surgeons were leaning back, tipping their hats, thinking, all right, this is our time. They finally figured out that stents don't prevent heart attacks, so it always has to be a bypass graft. That's the thing that prevents heart attacks. Hold on, pump the brakes, the ischemia trials, they were dialed in to put this exact idea to the test. And what did they find? Bypass grafts, they're not the silver bullet for stopping heart attacks, for preventing them either. It's like thinking you need a bigger boat when you really, what you need to understand is the ocean. We're learning that fixing hearts isn't just about diving in with surgery or procedures. It's more about understanding the whole map, your metabolism. It's not just choosing a different route. Remember, it's metabolism that drives tissue damage or tissue health. And with that, we move into the four food and supplement distortions that have been touted to you all along about how they can actually help you or do anything for your arteries, the gunk inside them, and how that interacts with whether or not you'll have a heart attack or stroke, leading us to some answers that you may not have heard of before. Food and supplement distortion number one, apple cider vinegar. Food and supplement distortion number two, vitamin K2. Food and supplement distortion number three, vitamin D. Food and supplement distortion number four, niacin. Food and supplement distortion number one, apple cider vinegar. Now, there's chat about it working through a satiety thing, apple cider vinegar. You know, slowing your stomach, emptying, keeping your stomach emptying slower to decrease the sugar impact in your blood, making you feel full, and maybe tweaking the stomach acid a little bit. It's supposed to slow down how fast your food gets through the old digestive tract. But here's where it gets a little bit wild. Most of the tall tales about apple cider vinegar, they're like a fish story that just keeps growing. We're talking claims that are stretched so thin, they're practically see-through at this point. Some are just plain out there, the kind of stuff that makes you wonder about what planet they came from. Misconception number two, vitamin K2. So the word on the street is that K2 waltzes in, yanks calcium out of your arteries, and plants it right in your bones. But hold your horses. It's not that straightforward. It's more about those enzymes doing their thing. Now, if I could just pluck calcium out of my artery wall, like picking apples off a tree, sure, that'd be dandy for reducing heart risks, maybe. But here's the real deal. Calcium in those artery walls? It's really more like a telltale sign of how stable your plaque is. So this whole idea of fishing calcium out of your arteries? What's the point? There was this study, a bunch of middle-aged guys with diabetes. They gave one group K2 and the other group a placebo. Here's what happened. The K2 crew showed some improvement in their insulin resistance, their diabetes. So here's where K2 might be playing a sneaky game. It might be messing with insulin resistance or diabetes, maybe even giving it a nudge in the right direction. K2's been on the rise. It's kind of like a rock star in the supplement charts. You've got sources of this stuff popping up left and right and doubling over the past year, all over the internet. It's like a K2 wildfire on YouTube. But when you dig into the nitty gritty, it's really more of a murky picture. It's it's not really crystal, crystal clear that K2's playing the calcium relocation game from arteries to bones. 
But where it might be throwing a punch is in the insulin resistance ring. Food and supplement misconception number three, vitamin D. There's a heap of evidence, a whole mountain of it, saying vitamin D is the real deal. It works. But let's take a step back, slow it down, and look at this evidence. Most of what we've got on vitamin D is like connecting dots. It's all about correlation. When it comes to hardcore, cause and effect, proof, well, there's not much of that rodeo. Vitamin D, when you give it a good look, it's like a Swiss army knife. It helps with sleep, nudges prediabetes in the right direction, boosts immune health, and it seems to be more about hitting the core of the system, maybe getting cozy with the mitochondria. But let's circle back to the whole correlation and causation thing. What we've got with vitamin D isn't like causation. That's really straightforward like tossing a rock at a beehive and getting stung. That's causation, clear as day. But the vitamin D story, it's more like correlation. It's like wearing your lucky socks to a football game and your team wins. Is it the socks? Well, maybe, maybe not. That's the world of correlation. After going back and forth on this, you may be wondering and asking, what do I do? I do use vitamin D, D3, I start with 5,000 international units, and then, you got it, test, don't guess. Get it to a blood level between 50 and 90. So, food supplement misconception number four, niacin. Whenever niacin pops up, you got to think about David Sinclair. This guy's all about the mitochondria, those powerhouses in our cells. Dive into any of his books, like Lifespan, and you see he's got a strong pitch for niacin and niacin-related products. He argues it's like a tune-up for your mitochondria. He wants to create and sell a pill form of the fountain of youth. But here's where it gets interesting. We've got folks coming in thinking niacin's the golden ticket, the answer to everything. Sinclair, he's the brain behind discoveries like resveratrol, the sirtuins, and his latest hit, NMN, what some are calling the forever pill. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Sure, there's solid evidence backing niacin, but it's not exactly the miracle worker it's often made out to be. I wouldn't bet my whole life on just niacin, you know. It's in our practice. It's one of the big two supplements that we use, niacin and vitamin D. But the key? Knowing when to use them, what to hold on to, and what to let go. We see a lot more folks walking in all charged up about niacin, more than we actually recommend. It's like they're hearing a whisper about it and they come running. So we've been through the misunderstandings, the real questions you should be asking, the most common misconceptions, and all those food and supplement distortions you've been deceived by. Which leaves you probably still asking the question, what foods, if any, have beneficial effects on your arteries. What is that number one meal to clean out your arteries? Now, when we're talking about what grub might be giving your arteries a high five, first things first, you got to tune into your body's rhythm. Like for some folks, downing 75 grams of carbs, glucose, that's like a large Coke at McDonald's, that sets their arteries ablaze for hours. And for others, a simple hamburger bun or a couple of slices of pizza can kick off a blood sugar storm, a hoedown that lasts way too long, stirring up inflammation in those artery walls. But let's get real. There ain't no magic roto-rooter food out there. No roto-rooter food. What we do have, though, are foods that don't throw gasoline on the fire. Ever heard that old saying? If you find yourself in a hole and you want to get out of that hole, stop digging. That's the deal with food and arteries. So you might not want to hear this, but yep, salads, broccoli, cauliflower, all that veggie stuff and rabbit food, they can be your arteries' best friends. And protein, that's no trouble either. Fish, good to go. Red meat, all right. We're stepping into that whole carnivore versus plant-based showdown. I know. I know. The plant 
plant-based diet fans might not want to hear this, but there's a growing pile of evidence saying that saturated fat isn't the artery arsonist that we thought it was. But here's the kicker. Remember how we talked about our own body fat being a backstage troublemaker in prediabetes? Saturated fat's like a calorie-packed party. A lot of folks find it tough to keep their body fat in check if they're loading up on saturated fat. And what about this keto burn idea? You know, the one where you can eat like a king all you want, as long as the carbs just aren't on the menu? Well, we do burn a little bit less efficiently when we're in ketosis, maybe 20%. And for some people, even 30% less efficient burn when they're not eating carbs. But that's really where it caps out. You can't just triple your calories and suspect ketosis to make it all go away, to make it vanish. So now we're there. We're finally at it. The number one meal to clean out your arteries. And what is it? It's actually the lack of a meal. It's fasting. Let's dive right into that. The why, the how, the magic. Question number one, why is fasting the best meal for cleaning out your arteries? Question number two, which form of fasting has the biggest impact in cleaning out your arteries? And question number three, does having clean arteries actually even matter? Question number one, why is fasting the best meal for cleaning out your arteries? Fasting is not just a weight loss journey, but a path to cellular tune-up. Fasting is often hitched to shedding pounds, but its real star role is in, is in this thing called autophagy. Think of autophagy like a cleanup crew inside your cells, healing out the broken parts and turning them into new energy. This whole process, it's like a reset button, dialing down inflammation and boosting your overall health vibe. Fasting is a crafty tool for fine-tuning metabolic health, turning down the heat on inflammation, all without tipping the scale. But, and this is the key, Fasting's a road that needs careful navigation. You got to make sure you're fueling up enough to dodge malnutrition, but that's not as difficult as some people think. Question number two, which form of fasting has the biggest impact on cleaning out one's arteries? Prolonged water fasting, it's like hitting the turbo button. Big, quick impact. But here's the thing, if shedding weight isn't on your to-do list, this might not be your best bet. This health journey we're talking about, it's not a quick dash or even a long haul marathon. Marathons wrap up in a few hours. But what we're diving into, it's a lifelong gig, a real game changer. It's about reshaping your whole eating playbook for keeps. And let's talk about this yo-yo fasting rodeo. Dropping weight, picking it back, adding 10 pounds, losing 10 pounds, adding it back. That's like a ride nobody wants to be on. So what's prolonged water fasting? Why is that the heavyweight champion of impact? Well, it's simple. It slashes calories like no other, at least on an immediate basis. The steeper and swifter you cut those calories, the faster you're diving into autophagy. But remember, we're playing the long game here. Say your metabolic rate's 2,000 calories a day. Skip eating for two days and you dodge 4,000 calories. Trim just 10% off of your daily intake for a week and you're down, you're only sidestepping 1,400 calories. But keep that up every day for a month and you're cutting out 5,600 calories. So what works for you? That's really the golden question. Some folks ride the wave of prolonged fasting, maybe every other week, sometime once a month or a quarter. Others groove better with intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. Then you've got the creative ones that are trying things like sardine fasts. Find your group, something you can jam with for the long haul. And those caveats to fasting for arterial health, some folks worry it's like a risky business. But let's be real. Humans have been fasting since the dawn of time. It's not some major hazard, except maybe for good health. Sure, it might make you a bit edgy, a little bit grumpy while you're at it, but that's just part of the ride with fasting. 
the assumption that a meal can clean your arteries. So besides the lack of a meal and activating autophagy, it really isn't about one special meal cleaning your arteries. It's the whole lifestyle. Diet's the king of the castle because you can't fast all the time. It's about what you're munching on 24-7, day in, day out, week after week, year after year, decade after decade. It's about reshaping your permanent eating habits. Rule numero uno, get to know your own metabolism. That's the key. Take a gander at some of the latest scoop. Uh, it looks like folks over 18 struggle with burning carbs, at least half of them. So when you're not burning carbs right, you start pumping out more insulin. And too much insulin puts the brakes on burning fat. It's like starting with a problem in one fuel tank and ending up with both tanks being on the fritz, leading to the Grim Reaper's insulin spiral of death. We talked about that before. Question number three, does having squeaky clean arteries really matter? Well, yeah, it, that depends on your definition of clean. If we're talking about arteries free of plaque, then it matters a lot. Why, do you ask? Plaque in those arteries is like having a ticking time bomb for cardiovascular events, the kind that can lead to some serious harm and even check you out of the game permanently. But here's the twist. The real McCoy in this story, it's not that plaque itself is the bad guy. It's the inflammation that comes with it. It's like an angry posse in your bloodstream. Inflammation, that's what really stirs up the danger. It's like having a quiet troublemaker in the crowd you don't even see the trouble until it's already up on you.